Hello and welcome to Money Life. This is Sucheta Dilal. This week we're going to discuss a slightly complex topic. It is about credit rating agencies and how their actions impact us. Need to explain it in a little detail because whenever they make mistakes, it is we the individual investors who pay a price. Now, banks also pay a price. In fact, 90% of ratings are ordered by banks before they give a loan. But you know how it is with banks. Either we are paying through the exchequer, which means even if you don't have a bank account, there are bailouts happening year after year. Bad loans, as you know, had reached anywhere between 10 lakh crore and 20 lakh crore. So money goes out of the system. What is worse is under the bankruptcy law, the same bankers who collude with companies are first in queue because they are secured. While the rest of us who invest through mutual funds, non-convertible debentures or any other instruments are unsecured and possibly not going to get anything. So let's look at developments in this context. Okay. So last week, I was very enthused when I saw a news item in the Economic Times which said that SEBI has finally begun to ask some serious questions and gather data about information that is provided by companies. Now, what kind of information is that? Corporate guarantees, which apparently prop up ratings when the promoter or the parent company issues a guarantee to a group company, subsidiary company or whatever. Capital market regulator has asked for details on this. It has also asked for details on companies that have been refusing to share data with the rating firms. Yeah, did you know that this happens? It's quite public. It's up there in on the websites of the rating agencies. So what companies do is get a rating because that's mandatory to get a loan. The minute they get a loan and the loan would be for a three year, five year, 10 year or longer, then stop cooperating with the rating agencies and don't give any further data. So the rating that you have is not updated, cannot be updated because there's no information. Rating agencies identify this. They say the company is not cooperating, but the fact is companies are getting away with it. And who is supposed to check them? Ministry of Corporate Affairs, SEBI, when it comes to listed companies, the Reserve Bank of India, through the banks, nobody has done anything. So stage one, SEBI has only called for data. And this action is sort of the last in the regulatory tightening process that has begun after several corporate horses are bolted. And you have been affected by all of them. Remember the 81 bonds, remember DHFL, remember ILFS, NCDs. The list is long. All of these companies were flying high. They were AAA rated. They fudged their audits. They had promoter guarantees that propped up the ratings. They had letters of comfort, LOC, letters of comfort, issued by the parents, individual industrialists, as well as parent companies. Who are these people? Infrastructure, leasing and financial services, like I mentioned, the Anil Ambani group in a big way. SR, and yes, SR is much bigger beyond SR Steel. Divan Housing Finance, DHFL, as you know, Videocon, the Bushan Group, Punj Lloyd, IVRCL, one can go on. So basically, like I said, when banks default, they get protected because they socialize their losses and get bailouts. Individuals pay a price. Amount is not small. It's over 25,000 crore that has been lost since 2018. Why is 2018 the benchmark? The big ILFS, DHFL, everything came out in the open around that time. So four years later, we are still slowly tightening the rules. Yes, SEBI took action. There was a lot of litigation. There were penalties against CRAs, but most of them ended up in the Supreme Court, which also did not understand the fiduciary role of CRAs. Now, CRAs have a lot to whine about, which is what this blog is about. But they did not reduce the rating in time because they were not aware of what's going on. So AAA suddenly became D or junk almost overnight. And along with it, your chances of recovering any money in those debentures just vanished into thin air. Yes, people are fighting. I don't know what's going to happen in India. Litigation is expensive. People don't get together. It takes decades. And even if you get a positive result, which is rare, it is eventually meaningless. So let's understand what I call the scourge of hidden guarantees. I've already told you that personal guarantees are given by promoters 
by parent companies. ILFS, they even have some adjustments where they pool cash flows for special purpose vehicles and there were hundreds of them. Remember, ILFS had 347 companies. So, what happened is ILFS was a big shocker because it was seen as a government company. It was a public-private partnership and most people, ask anyone on the street, they believed it was a government company. So, the Joint Parliamentary Committee got a little active after that and in March 2021, it came up with a report which focused on credit ratings. It asked that the credit rating framework should be tightened to ensure greater disclosure, including the extent of promoter support, linkages with subsidiaries, liquidity position to meet near-term debt payment obligations, etc. We wanted the larger picture. The report, of course, did not bother to tabulate the enormous corporate guarantees that had already been accepted by public sector banks largely or from leading industrialists without shred of asset to back them. So they were largely unenforceable legal agreements. Now, you want to look at the numbers? Some PSPs, a bunch of them together, accepted a personal guarantee of 13,000 crore from Prashanta and Ravi Ruya of the SR group in a company called SR Investments. Not the big SR Steel, Power, Oil or whatever, SR Investments. 13,000 crore. When it went to court, when it went before the DRT in Ahmedabad, they said they hardly have any personal assets between them, so there are no claims that can be made from them personally. Did the banks not know it? Of course they knew it. Has anyone been punished? No. And in case you're mistaken, this is not about SR Steel, where even after it was sold to ArcelorMittal, banks tried to enforce a bank guarantee and that was thrown out. This is different. Similarly, public sector banks had taken personal guarantees of 11,500 crore personal from the Dooth brothers of Videocon. When they're trying to sell that whole company, they're not even getting half the amount before the bankruptcy court. So this is how bankers have behaved when it comes to their fiduciary responsibility. But it's not limited to India alone. The Chinese banks lent 700 million to Anil Ambani against his personal guarantee and they're struggling all over the world to recover that. Even after a positive order in the UK, nothing much is happening. RBI, after the Joint Parliamentary Committee, has sort of stepped in in April 2022. It's issued new instructions, updated its mark, uh, master circular and tightened the rules for guarantees and co-acceptances by banks. So it has said very clearly that such guarantees cannot enhance the credit rating unless they are watertight and there are strict timelines for invoking the guarantees, which means legal ag agreement has to be really watertight. How is RBI going to monitor that is another story, but at least it's tightened the rules, it's fixed accountability. There is a step in the right di direction. Like I said, implementation and enforcement is a challenge. Banks continue to find ways to avoid compliance. Former chairman of a leading public sector bank, when I asked him about this, told me that bankers, when they are chasing people, the large industries, to give them loans, they look for lending opportunities and accept dodgy letters of comfort and unenforceable bank guarantees. Like the Ruyas, there are no assets, but they take a guarantee, which is meaningless because they'll say the group is so much larger, but you're accepting a personal guarantee, which requires personal assets. They don't bother about it. And yes, most industrialists hold assets through smaller companies, not in their personal names. So unless those companies give a guarantee, it is as good as unsecured, he says. And this is how it ought to be treated. In fact, he pointed me to an international case, which is HF HSPC versus Jurong Engineering, which is being quoted all over the media, where an appellate court rejected the enforceability of a letter of comfort given to HSBC, saying it was not binding in nature because the words were such that it doesn't at all look like there was an intention or legal binding obligation that was intended to be created. Now, as I said before, it's not enough for RBI to give instructions. This is exactly what will happen in India. This is what has happened in India with the Dutz and the Ambani and Ruya. So unless there's a model agreement or letter of comfort agreement, we will have the problem coming out several years down the line when there is a default. Otherwise, things get hidden. When people pay, there's no issue. 
Now, this is really important today because private bankers say after the government announced a 15% tax rate on new manufacturing, many existing companies are setting up new capacity in subsidiary companies to avoid taxes. Now, the subsidiary companies are new, they can't get a loan, so they are backed by a guarantee or comfort letter from the parent, what the top banker tells me. That means more and more of these are being generated. If there is a problem, you are going to know it 4-5 years down the line. RBI has announced rules, according to me, not tight enough. The second problem is information asymmetry or lack of data sharing. This is something you will understand. If you default on a loan or if you take a loan, it's immediately reflected in your credit score. You get calls, your credit score goes up and down. Today, your interest rate depends on whether your score is high or not. Do you know that no such mechanism exists for companies? So they have multiple ways of taking money. It's all in the formal sector. It's far easier to do than a credit score for individuals. But such is the power of corporates over regulators that this has been a work in progress forever. A few years ago, there was an attempt to push it forward. There's talk about a company. A setup to list all these loans happening, but 90% of all ratings are for bank loans, but there is no up to date information. Now, let's come to a third issue, which is non cooperation of borrowers. Credit rating agencies, as the rules got tightened and they got punished by SEBI and RBI, have themselves gone to the regulators and complained that as many as 15,000 companies, most of them unlisted, refuse to furnish, furnish updated information. I've already told you this. Rating rules require that the financial instrument has to be rated throughout its lifetime. Now, what does a rating agency do if there's no information? It wants to stop the rating. It requires a no objection certificate from banks if it is a bank loan. Banks are apparently unwilling to give it. So that rating is up there, meaningless, and the rating agency only says company is not cooperating but the rating remains, it cannot be updated. Banks, if you ask me, are colluding because they can turn on the heat, they can put pressure on companies to ensure that they cooperate. What happens with debentures? This goes to SEBI. SEBI is a regulator. CRAs have complained that SEBI is also unwilling to allow the rating to be stopped. So you will neither force the companies to give information nor allow the rating to be stopped. So you have situation. But mind you, at one level, this is an excuse because the big companies where ratings have gone from A to D like ILFS and DHFL, this did not apply. So it doesn't absolve rating agencies, but it's a point that they have to make. So SEBI needs to act. SEBI has called for data. First step, just a small step. It has to remove the anomaly where it is allowing higher ratings. That's what it's doing. So RBI has issued instructions. SEBI has to issue identical instructions saying just because you have a let letter of comfort or corporate guarantees, you are not going to allow a higher rating, which is permitted today for debentures. And this, these are called higher ratings for structured obligations. What is structured obligations? These are synthetic financial instruments that are created for companies to be able to borrow money. Senior banker tells me ever since credit rating started in the country, the whole structured obligation concept was by and large deeply flawed. Now, Mr. R. Balakrishnan, who is a columnist with Money Life, has spent many years with Crystal in the formative years, tells us what is an SO. So, SO is anything that changes the intrinsic credit rating of an instrument. It is identified by a separate symbol to denote that it's not a vanilla credit rating, he says. And what is included here is third party guarantees by the parent, even external support. Sometimes the company keeps aside liquid collateral to ensure credit enhancement by assuring timely payments. All these are called structured obligations and the CRA or credit rating agency decides what is acceptable to permit an enhanced rating. Retail investors are not exposed directly to structured obligations because this is not meant for them. But as always, however careful you are individually, your mutual fund can go and do all of that. So Money Life and Money Life's editor have been saying for a long time that mutual fund managers have been turned from 
expert investors, you paying for the expertise to investment bankers and lenders. And we have seen this happening and playing out damagingly time and again. It happened with Z, if you remember. It happens apparently with structured obligations as well. So what Mr. Balakrishnan tells us is, of late we are seeing instances where fund managers seem to be granting time to the issuer to reschedule payments. It's none of their business. We don't know about it. He also says this effort has often failed and CRAs are then held accountable for negligence of fund managers. Yes, they may get punished. SEBI may discover this, SEBI may punish it, but it's usually too late. We've also seen how fund managers dubiously colluded to hide the pledge of promoter holding. I told you that was in Z, the Z group. Mr. Balakrishnan hopes that before the regulator steps into micromanage ratings, it should consider barring mutual funds from investing in structured instruments altogether. Now, a lot of people may think this is extreme, but improving the quality of credit ratings will clearly require RBI and SEBI to get a public credit registry growing, going. So if you have a credit registry for individuals, you need a public credit registry for all the borrowings and all this information that companies and banks are not willing to share, defaults that are not, they are not willing to share should be available online. Why not with a score in a public registry, credit registry? That has been a slow motion action happening for the last decades. It gets talked about every few years. It has to mandate better disclosures and ensure compliance. The buck stops with the regulators. Until then, what they're doing is good. It's a step forward, but essentially tinkering. This affects you. So I would su suggest hear it carefully, spread the word, make people aware, and when the time is right, raise your voice. Thank you.